Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on wherever you're in the world. And joining us today on Pandemic Punditry's Marketing in a Pandemic, we are thrilled and honored to have Colin Anderson, the Managing Director of Brand and Founder of Brand Courage with us, uh, joining us from Singapore today. Uh, so today we're going to talk about branding in courageous times. And then boy, these are such times. Uh, really, uh, really happy to have you with us, uh, Colin. And uh, I know that you know you were a managing director of Ogilvy for for a while as well. You have a very uh, sort of extensive and and uh, accomplished uh, uh, background in terms of uh, your field. So it might be who useful to our listeners to just sort of and and viewers to sort of get an idea of you know your background and and sort of what you've been doing in the last uh, few years. Okay. Well, firstly, let me say thank you to both of you for inviting me along to talk to you today. So this is the first time we've done a, a webinar together. So it's kind of yeah. like a little bit of a debut. And of course, I uh, want to make this happen again and again and again. Um, you know, um, I you know, maybe to start off with saying, you know, that, you know, I always feel that um, in order for you to improve, uh, you always have to think about going outside your comfort zone. Now, it's like everybody talks about public speaking as being outside their comfort zone, but that's not actually the analogy I'm drawing. What I wanted to say is to, to those guys and uh, ladies and guys who are listening to us today is that, you know, brand is definitely an area that a lot of people feel is outside of their comfort zone. And so today, I'd like to be able to spend a little bit of time kind of reassuring them that it's not so difficult and not so um, uh, such an audacious task to take on and look at your brand in a kind of uh, constructive way. So uh, to answer your question a little bit about my background, I actually began uh, my career in the 80s uh, as a designer. And uh, as a graphic designer, you kind of, uh, what my, my, my key focus was on, on identity. Um, but very quickly, you know, um, I found that there was a serious problem. And that was that, you know, design by definition is the optimum in a particular set of circumstances. And talking to clients, clients didn't really understand design. They didn't understand you know, the, the context of what it is that I did as an, an identity designer. So I had to kind of reinvent the process of how do I find out what is the particular set of circumstances? Um, and what's really prevalent to that and what happened, you know, why is that relevant today is that especially when you talk about COVID and you talk about what is happening, this is a matter of we have to realign what we see as our circumstances. We're no longer in, in the same world. <clears throat> in fact, you know, simply looking at how technology has changed everything. Again, you know, growing up in the 80s, uh, you know, I used to do a lot of corporate literature and we used to do everything manually. You know, there was no such thing as computers, no such right. thing as uh, the Internet. Uh, if you wanted to research something, you go to the library. Nowadays, you know, <laughs> it makes my job a lot easier. If I want to look at all the competitors for a company, I just look at their websites and I really have a very clear idea of how everybody does what they do. Um, so you mentioned also that, of course, that um, my my business now, and, and I've been running this one for 15 years um, after I kind of sold an original business to Ogilvy. I wasn't the managing director of Ogilvy, but I was the managing director of the business that I, I, I took over with, with them, uh, which was at that time called Enterprise IG. Uh, now it's uh, called uh, Super Union, uh, and it's probably one of the biggest brand identity companies in the world. But, you know, I digress. Um, brand Courage really, for me, is, 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 a, is, is a boutique brand and communications business. We have offices in Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. And I've done work all over the region, including India. Um, and I'm happy to say that it's always a pleasant experience working with Indian companies. Um, my kind of like my, uh, my mantra is uh, fortune favors the brave. And um, I actually uh, used that long before John Wick used it on his movies, you know. <laughs> You know those ones, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, he has it did. tattooed. He has it tattooed on his back. Well, I don't have it tattooed on my back, but anyway. But do you um, have the dog? <laughs> I used to. Unfortunately, he passed away, but that's another story. Um, you know, when I say you know, fortune favors brave. It's not just me that has to be brave. And I mean, you know, yes, I do think that um, I have to really tell it as it is. Uh, I'm not really an order taker, but someone that really has to look and give. Uh, my clients good advice it's also comes down to the fact that you know brands have to be brave as well and you know now it, more than ever you know you really have to reevaluate what you're doing how you're saying it how you're going to market every single aspect of your uh, experience it really comes into question so you know in kind of 
thinking about what I wanted to say in this kind of in, in context, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe for the viewer's perspective, giving them an idea of what brand is, um, and especially from a practitioner's perspective, uh, I, I usually use this definition, and it's the kind of like the, the formal definition for brand is the management's long-term uh, strategy for the protection and exploitation of intangible assets for commercial advantage. And you go, what? <laughs> what is that? What did you say? So it's clearly not just the logo. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> no. Brand is behavior and it is reputation. And you think of it, that formula, brand equals behavior equals reputation it is how we behave it is how we want to be seen in the future and with that definition it's going to touch a lot of other things uh it's a you know we, we say kind of sometimes you know it's the intangible assets can outweigh the value of the tangible you know if someone like say for instance apple suddenly all of their physical assets disappeared tomorrow how much would that brand still be worth in fact, it would still be intact and probably at the same uh, commercial value that it has uh, uh, in, in the marketplace right now. Um, another kind of way to look at this, and, and um, you know, um, Einstein said, sometimes uh, what counts cannot be counted and what can be counted doesn't count. And the question always asked to me is, oh, I'm going to do this exercise with my brand. How much value will it increase? <laughs> And it's an, an intangible value is really, really hard to kind of like wrap your head around. Um, so, you know, usually uh, in the context of when I'm talking to a client like that, especially if they've got a very kind of rational perspective on what value actually means, I use uh, an example of the, the, the humble IKEA bag. So if you, you know, I mean, I'm just in India, you have Ikea. I mean, yes, they're, 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 they're the biggest restaurant chain in the world, believe it or not. But yeah. Ikea produce these little tout bags, right? They're, you know, they're blue and they've got a slash fan. And if you have them inside, they're yellow. And the outside, they're blue, right? Funny. Um, they're about 90 cents in Singapore. Now, I was um, in Malaysia the other day, oh, not the other day, but six months ago. Um, and I went past uh, a retail chain called Off-White. You might be familiar with that brand. It's uh, quite a high-end fashion shop. And in the window, they had this IKEA bag. I mean, it was just like the IKEA bag. It's the same size. It had the straps, everything. Um, so I went inside and said, so how much is this bag worth? Yeah, and said, $295.90 uh, US. So, you know, it's not the material value. It's, it's the fact that it has a label on it that suddenly the humble 90 cents Ikea bag becomes worth 295 US dollars, okay? So it's not that you can just stick a price tag on it and it works. How does that kind of figure? And now you're gonna kind of work into the area where we're gonna to touch the sloppy wet stuff between people's ears, right? Just imagine, say for instance, you're gonna buy a car, all right? So, you know, when you look at buying a car, there's lots of things that you can evaluate. You can evaluate its price, its weight, its fuel efficiency, its engine, uh, its torque, power, acceleration, all things very important, okay? And if I list this all out, you and you compare all these vehicles in that way, it'd be very, very hard. But if I said to you, Mercedes, BMW, Jaguar, Aston Martin, it gives you a totally different feeling. You start to imagine things. You start to have a thought in your head that comes maybe from your background, maybe from a past experience, maybe something that you admired. Maybe, ah, oh, I've always aspired to be this, or I've always had that and I've wanted this. And all these kind of things come to play. They are emotional things. And that's really kind of where that brand resides. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, and I was meeting up for lunch with a, an Indian friend of mine and it's pouring with rain in Singapore. And I, I usually ride a motorbike. So if I'm going to go to his house in the rain, I'm going to definitely get soaked. Anyway, he offered to pick me up in his car. I've never actually been in his car. And so my girlfriend and I were walking downstairs to, to and we kind of just guessed. He said, so what car do you think he drives? And uh, my girlfriend said, oh, I think he's an Audi. He's kind of like, like he likes the German precision kind of cars. I said, no, no, no. I think he's a very conservative. Maybe he's a bit kind of like tight with the money. I think it's a Toyota, right? Reliability, you know, dependability. Um, and I don't know, but here, all the cars here are all over $100,000 at least. And here, the only 
you can only use them for 10 years and then they had to be scrapped at zero value. So what you spend on a car very quickly diminishes over time. Mm -hmm. So guess what car you have? Can you give me a guess? Was it the Toyota or was it the Audi? I'd say a Toyota. Okay. <laughs> Kathiga, what did you say? I'd say an Audi. Okay, okay. Well, actually, it was a Maserati. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it, would go, it was going to be outside of the, the, the question there. <laughs> it's, it was, it's amazing. I mean, it's, you know, it's, a, you know, it's how you read people and how you think and what you think they like and what they're going to do can sometimes be very amazing, right? So, you know, again, going back to this whole thing, it is kind of like uh, it's the experience. And that's kind of what that brand stands for. What a brand is, it's kind of like an experience. You know, so getting into his car, you know, the smell of the leather, you know, the feel of acceleration when he shot off poof, like that. Well, okay. <laughs> it's definitely not a Toyota. Um, and, you know, <laughs> That's kind of how we kind of see these the, 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 our brand um, is that we view it by our experiences. We view it by our, our, the touch points that it's had in our life. Again, maybe continuing the car analogy is, you know, if you just had a recently had an accident with a with, with a with a, 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 a nasty guy that jumps out of a Mercedes, maybe you kind of have a negative feeling towards Mercedes because it rubs off on you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you know, uh, yeah. So this this concept, I think mm. you know, you you gave a really brilliant dis, uh, d uh, definition about the emotional versus the rational sort of uh, mm. valuation that one puts to brand, right? Mm. Uh, so given sort of the, you know the times that we are in, where you know some of us who own Maseratis or even a Toyota or a humble uh, uh, you know Mini Cooper cannot seem to get out of the garage because there's yeah. not much of that going on uh, from a right, uh, right. perspective, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, or Hyundai, for for example. So you can't really, you know, some of these uh, brands are having a, a tough time. Um, I mean, I read a statistics this morning that, you know, 19 million salary jobs in India were lost. 25 million salary jobs in Southeast Asia have been lost, right? So these are sort of, uh, you know, times where companies are struggling to sort of maybe, uh, you know, get the attention of the limited amount of spend that's available. So yeah. how does sort of one uh, appeal to either the rational or the emotional aspects of a brand? So if you're a company, a CEO or a marketer, uh, how would you, you know, re do you rebrand re yourself or redefine yourself? You know, what is the sort of the prescription of strategy or, or do you sort of, um, you know, move your brand from, you know, maybe you were known for, for say, a, you, know, you know, Maserati, for example, right? Now, you know, you want to, you know, obviously, People are not, they're not flying off the showrooms because there's hardly any driving going on. Or, or maybe there is a way to sort of, you know, a smart branding uh, marketer would, would come up with a way to keep the brand in, in people's uh, mm. minds in, in this yeah. time when everybody's sort of sequestered. Mm. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. Let me, let me give you an example of this. And it's funny because I was having a conversation with a, a very good a friend of mine who is also, man he has a, he's a, has his own branding company as well. And we were having this kind of like discussion about the difference between the strategy of McDonald's versus the strategy of uh, Burger King and KFC. So uh, we all took, we both took different perspectives. So we were polar in it. So I took actually the KFC slash uh, uh, Burger King strategy, and he took the McDonald's strategy, which was during COVID, and especially in Singapore, where we had this period of time where it was very obvious that we had to shut everything down. Now, I know India is a very difficult place to shut down. Singapore, at least, you know, we're only 6 million people and we're only, you know, 50 miles, uh, you know, across and 50 miles deep. So we're, we're a lot easier to contain. But, you know, McDonald's took the, the, the premise that they were going to shut all of their stores. They didn't want to spread anything to their staff. They didn't want to spread anything to customers. They just shut down. However, the opposite was actually true of uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. They, they said they wanted to celebrate the fact that, you know, we know that our, our customers were stuck at home, that they, they didn't have access to, uh, you know, all the normal things they've had. They couldn't go out and dine. So come and get your, uh, you know, your takeaway food from us mm -hmm. uh, and we'll keep you happy. So, you know, which strategy is right and which strategy is wrong? You know, after the fact, when you come back, actually McDonald's, you know, bounced back. But, you know, has, has Kentucky Fried Chicken actually gained market share? 
because they were there with you going through that process? Or is it McDonald's was seen as the ones that were very altruistic, not caring about profit, but really looking to try to make sure that anything was, nothing was spread? You know? And I think both strategies are actually valid. Right? So there isn't any rights or wrongs in this. And sometimes these things can backlash to you in different ways. Uh, I'm, I'm deliberately not answering the question, but you know, it is like when you look at your circumstances, you have to consider you know, what everybody else does within your business. I'm gonna give you an instance like, you know, when you are comparing yourself against your competitor and what strategy they're doing, it definitely will impact you. You cannot think of yourself as being alone. Um, some people have taken the uh, kind of uh, the, you know, taking a cause, for instance, you know, so, you know, all this stuff about Black Lives Matters, you know, people are jumping on the bandwagon. Oh, you know, we, we you know, we do this. Why? Because they're trying to get attention for their brands. They're trying to stand out. I was talking to a friend the other day about uh, what Ben and Jerry were doing, doing in, in England. Um, and he was specifically there. And he said something about how Ben and Jerry was were talking out against the, 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 the UK government, who said that they didn't, they wanted to stop all of these people coming across the border from France, illegal immigrants. Yet, Actually, when you look at it and their practices in the US, they were actually recently uh, prosecuted by the US government for, uh, for using uh, unregistered uh, illegal labor right. in the US market uh, and paying them and treating them um, irresponsibly. So, you know, if you're going to take a course, you better make sure that you're really committed to that cause. Don't do it as something that is superficial, something that you kind of think, oh, it's a marketing space. It's a marketing angle, you know, but, you know, it's, you know, if you are who you are, if you can be true to who you are, and I get, I'm going to get into that a little bit later, because your question is a little bit complex to answer because you haven't got all the bits yet. Um, right. But to, to premise that, I would say that you need to have something that's very compelling and it has to be absolutely true. So what I'm saying, a compelling truth is both of those things. Um, and if you can get that right, whether we are in a crisis, whether we're in a COVID situation, whether we're some other thing, this is what really counts. This is what really means something to our consumers. So maybe, you know, again, coming back to say, giving a difference between rational and emotional behaviors, uh, I wanted to say that, you know, a lot of times, um, we think as business owners that everybody's thinking about our business, about our brands, but they're not, right? Um, you know, I usually use this kind of analogy, and I got this actually from a, from a, a, I think it was from McDonald's. It was a cup, and it had a picture of Homer Simpson on, and it had on the top it said the thoughts of Homer, and actually if you looked at his brain, what it said was really interesting because this is true. When we go out to compete in the marketplace, we're not competing against, say, for instance, we're in real estate. We're not competing against other real estate companies. What we're competing against is sex, donuts, and sweet, sweet beer. And that's exactly what was in Homer's head. And it's very true. It's like people aren't thinking about this. Um, they're not kind of like uh, in, in, in a kind of like an open mode. They're kind of like closed in their thoughts. They're thinking about something else. And, you know, uh, to give you kind of... Um, kind of an idea about this you know they say conscious versus unconscious so conscious works at about 20 bits per second that's how much thinking you know you're, you see my face you hear mm -hmm. my voice maybe you can see what's in the background behind me that's that's working for you at about 20 bits per second but there's a, another 8 million bits that you're processing right now that you're not even aware of Okay, so this, the feeling of your clothes on your skin, the temperature of the room, the ambient sound, all these things are things that are going on in your head. So let me get to the point, right? So say, for instance, you're going to the supermarket and you're going to, to buy your groceries. So I don't know how long you guys take. Um, I, I usually take about 45 minutes to half an hour maximum. Right? I, I want to get in, get out, right? If you had to choose every single product, on your list, it will take you about eight hours. The reason why it only takes you half an hour is because you've already made up your mind. So you have to think in the context, even say if in COVID, that you are competing with a whole bunch of stuff that are already automated. There's already a whole bunch of things that are already there. And you're gonna to have to create something very meaningful, very compelling in order to get that cut through. So, you know, 
I've done a lot of packaging design. So packaging design is like, it, we call it the last three feet or the last meter where you can get someone to change their minds. But, you know, in terms of the customer, what they're buying a lot of times is they're not buying a product. They're buying something that they imagine is part of their life. So you kind of got to fit into them. You've got to understand what they think, how they feel in order to be, really be relevant. So sometimes when I do kind of I work with clients, I say to them, so imagine that you're a superhero. I say, what is your superpower? <laughs> and I try to get them to kind of reveal to me what is really compelling and what is really true. And it's not an easy thing to find. So if you are then you're a brand owner, you have to really think very, very hard about this question. And you know, it comes down to uh, a, a really um, um, the question about why. So it's why me? Why am I relevant? Why choose me? And uh, there's a lot of things that obviously work against you. Um, when I think, I think about the worst strategies ever, um, I actually don't think about uh, commercial things. I actually think about movies. So you think about Star Wars, right? So I don't know if you guys are Star Wars fans. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> we're, we're both nerds. So, yeah. Yeah, both nerds. So, so am I, so am I. So, you know, so here it is, you know, the Imperial, right? You know, death, you know, the, you know you've got Dark Vader, you've got all these guys. And they invent the Death Star. So the Death Star is the one thing that's going to kill all the, you know, kill all the rebels and terrorize everybody. But unfortunately, there's always a weakness, you know, and the rebels somehow come along and they find that weakness, they exploit that weakness and they blow it up. So what is the strategy that the Imperial uh, depart with? Build a bigger Death Star. And guess what? The rebels find the weakness, they blow it up. And what they do, we're going to build the Death Planet. Yeah, that will do it. This, there's a problem here. Can you see the problem with their strategy, right? They're thinking along the same lines all the time. In COVID, we're going to have to change the way we think. Uh, Apple used to actually have a strategy, or, or it's a stat line, which I used to love, called Think Differently. Um, and it's kind of that is, that's kind of where it has to be. And um, again, just, just to do another, another little story, you think about Charles Darwin. He said that it isn't, the, the strongest or the smartest uh, of any species that will survive. It's that that is the most responsive to change. To change. Yeah. Yes. Actually, you got a question? So, yeah, actually, Colin, hmm. I had an interesting question because you keep, uh, you were talking a lot about brands and, you know, what value the brands can provide, et cetera, and the hmm. difference between rational and emotion, right? It's interesting hmm. because I think when COVID broke, uh, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of, uh, you know, Google Alphabet, he wrote saying, in this unprecedented moment, we feel a great responsibility to help. So how can brands help? And follow-up question to that is, how can you then create an effective brand that is seen as being helpful? Right, right. So, so the trick here is how do I, how do I help, but not look like I'm trying to help because I want something out of it. <laughs> you know, if you're if you're truly altruistic, if you have truly have something that is not a marketing ploy, because people see through it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the thing about the internet is that it it reveals everything. Um, you know. Uh, and I, I can't remember the actual campaign, but I think it was it was one of these large organisations in the in the UK who were uh, basically firing people. And um, the the people that were being fired were talking about it through uh, Twitter. Um, and it was the managing uh, it was sorry it was the marketing director who said, "Now how do I turn this Twitter thing off?" Because you know he wanted to stop the conversation that made his company look bad. Right? right. The fact is that people know everything. I mean, I, I love the how all those things happened with, uh, you know, Dr. Dow. You know, remember this guy who got assaulted on the plane uh, yeah, while he United. was traveling uh, United Airlines. Right. And, uh, and the, the CEO came up with this kind of speech to his team saying, well done. You did the best thing, blah, blah, blah. And of course, everybody knows everything, you know, so the videos really, you know, everybody can, you know, it, and it comes down to, well, is that a good thing for the brand when they they suddenly their their share price took a big dive? That's not a good thing, is it really? 
So, you know, authenticity becomes a really important characteristic of your brand plan. And you don't plan it just because it's COVID. You plan it because you're going to have to live past COVID and past the next crisis and the next crisis and the next crisis, right? So being authentic to yourself is really important. And I say sometimes, how do I find what is my voice? What is my authenticity? What do I really mean? And in, in a general context, brand only has, sorry, business only has two things to do, to innovate and to market. That's it, right? Everything else doesn't count. So if you're going to do this and you think that's my role as a brand owner or as a business owner, as an asset owner, whatever it is I'm in the, the business of, that's what I'm there to do, to find innovation, to innovate in my space and to take that to the marketplace. And brand actually is the driving force for both. If you think about, you decide on this is the type of business I am. This is what I am committed to. Therefore, these are the things I'm going to do. So, you know, yes, jumping on a cause, great idea, but make sure that it really is what you believe in and it's not some fake thing that has been dropped up by the, the marketing department. You know, so, right, so you know, you, those if your human values, uh, what you're saying is mm. if your values to begin with, um, mm. you know, were based on some, some fundamentals, like say, say for example, uh, you know, you had altruism, uh, sustainability from, from an environmental perspective, yeah. uh, you know, uh, just caring for the planet as a sort of a core mm. value prior yeah. to your, to your sort of journey or prior to COVID or any crisis. Yeah. And that's part of your authentic self, right? So then mm. championing those um, those values through your brand is completely uh, legitimate. Authentic. Yeah, yes. and legitimate. Yeah. Right. Mm. But but this sudden and what you're what you're cautioning against, I guess, is the, in this narrative is that uh, you know, sudden adoption, unless it's sort of caught your values uh, of causes, however, you know, Mm. popular they may be at the time maybe it's detrimental to your to your overall brand if it's if Correct. it can't be sustained by by behavior yeah. action and past history remember brand equals behavior yeah. equals yeah. reputation yeah. that's yeah. what i said in the beginning and i hold that true yeah. i mean one of the ways of being able to find the solution to this especially in covid where things have been slow is to take the time to really you know look at yourself under the microscope to really re-examine those values. And one of the ways you can do this is to walk in the shoes of your consumers. Um, you know, mm -hmm. walk, walk through their shoes, see it through their eyes and see how you look and how you appear. You know, um, online gives everybody a plethora of choices. So again, ask the question, why, why this brand? Why this company? Why this service? Why this offering? Um, you know, and we were talking earlier about, you know, mystery shopping, you know, and, you know, mystery shopping is also a kind of way. And there's a show that I love uh, in the U S and UK uh, where it's the undercover boss and the undercover boss goes in as a worker. He's wearing a kind of disguise and he has a false identity and he's a, usually a lowly worker who goes into the factory and starts working with his people, but they don't know it's him. And the fun, funny thing is that what he discovers is always he discovers people that are on brand and he discovers people that are not on brand. Those people that are on brand are they espouse the values that he put in as the founder of that company and they live that day in, day out. And then he meets other people that unashamedly go run against that and they are doing detriment to his brand. So, of course, when he's finished this thing and he reveals himself, da -da, you know, I'm really the secret boss, you know, those people that have done really well in his eyes are usually rewarded. Um, and those people that obviously haven't, then, you know, the consequences are different for them. But what is interesting is that within your own company, within your own business, there's probably a lot of things going on that you're not aware of. Um, and, you know, until you kind of, uh, are able to to evaluate it at a, that, that sort of shop floor level, you're not really going to be in touch with everything. So walking through the shoes of a customer is almost like saying, what happens when people complain? Right? So Colin, there's actually an interesting question from one of our uh, one of our attendants. Yeah. Uh, Chris, actually, Chris Langwall. Hi, hi Chris. <laughs> Thank you for, <laughs> Thank for, you for your question. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Um, so he's basically saying he'd love to pick your brain on the gap that exists between human values and purchasing behavior, right? Because what he's saying is in settings such as focus groups, people answer one way, 
But the moment they're in front of a supermarket shelf, their buying behavior doesn't reflect their focus group answer. And how can a brand help close this gap? Okay, because what, what you're doing there is you're probably asking the most obvious question and people lie. They don't always tell the truth. Uh, focus groups are always interesting because there's also a group dynamic. So people feel a little bit intimidated to say what they really mean in front of everybody. So you've got to find another way of being able to find out what people think uh, other than just the humble focus group uh, and asking the obvious questions. Sometimes what I tend to do, especially in a focus group, is I'm asking questions that unearth their real motivations. You know, you've really got to delve into what, uh, what what people see in what it is that they're purchasing, and uh, uh, and you know this is not a simple question to answer because again it depends a lot on the product, it depends on the group of people. There's a whole range of different variables involved, but I would say in the first instance, if you're getting a difference between human values and the purchase behavior, it's because people are lying about it. So you've got to find a way of making people be able to tell the truth without necessarily being judged or that they are revealing something to you that they don't want to, you know, um, you know, and, and, and this kind of goes very deep into the whole way you research a brand and what the brand is worth and how it is valued. Uh, and that's why, you know, secret shopper is a really interesting way to go because it's revealing secret behaviors. Um, you know, the same shopper can perform different types of kind of uh, responses on different days. So it's completely infuriating to anybody that's expecting it to be kind of, you know, one size fits all, or we're trying to make everybody conform to a certain behavior difference. You know, I always, I never look at uh, demographic, I look at psychographic, and I try to understand the thinking behind the people. What, what do you read? What car do you drive? Where do you live? What values do you have? What kind of family background is there? You know, all those things can add up to a different kind of look or how you profile your ideal customer. And, um, you know, that's why I'm saying, you know, sometimes by doing this kind of customer journey is a way of being able to step through it in a very kind of uh, methodical way to make sure that you plug the holes and close the gaps. You know, say, for instance, if you're a coffee shop and you're going to you know, launch a new product, you know, how do you, do you do that? Do you consult with the customers first? Do you show them what you have in mind in the terms of flavors, the packaging? They try it, they get involved in it, you know, so that when the product goes to launch, uh, they have some kind of like uh, empathy for it or is it that you don't use like, this here it is do you like it now there's two day different approaches um and again you know when you think about research you think about how you then talk to customers i don't ask them the most obvious questions like say for instance if i'm a hotel what did you think of the bed what did you think of the f and b experience maybe you ask the question what is the most fantastic holiday you've ever had and then you'll get a very different emotional response, one that is maybe more authentic, more honest and more useful, because then you can think, ah, OK, if they really think like that, then I have to do this. And it's not going to be a literal translation. It's going to be something where you have to think a lot harder. Um, you know, we, we talked about I talked about that, that spa thing, right, with you earlier on. Uh, and then here, here's another, yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's another one where, you know, um, I was working with a hotel group in Indonesia. And uh, again, I was doing that. I was, I was actually not there on a secret shopper. But because I was going to be working with this brand, I thought what I'd do is a little bit of kind of homework. So, you know, you know I walked into the hotel room. God, you know, there's a pubic hair in the bathtub. You know, there was a, a dead cockroach underneath the, underneath the sink. I photographed all these things. And why? Because I want to show them what the experience is like. Do you know this is what I saw? And, and that's me. I mean, maybe the other people see other things. Uh, you know, Michael Wolf, who was, uh, you know, a very famous uh, advertising um, uh, person, he said that uh, he has a book, actually. It's called You Are a Towel. And, uh, you know, you go into a hotel and if the towel is kind of a bit dirty, you then find, oh, there's a crack in the wall. There's this, there's that. And you start to evaluate it from a very negative perspective. So, you know, his, his philosophy there is that you are that towel. What are, you, what are you going to be and what are you going to bring to it? Um, so, you know, that's, again, it's another kind of way to look at it. Um, um, Colin, sorry, we yeah. just had another question come in. Because you're focusing yeah. a lot on experiences and stuff, what the audience mm. really want to know is whether the traditional four piece of marketing product, you know, price, okay. promotion, place, mm. do they matter? Or is it more about solution than product? And I think okay. we can tag on to that to say, 
how what then are the five p's of your brand okay so let, that's that's really good let me say that you know we, we we talk when we talk about branding i try to think about a way to make it easier for everybody to remember everything about their brand, right? Okay, so I kind of create, you know, this kind of, remember I said to you, you know, when I was a designer, nobody kind of understood what it was that I did. So it's the same with brand. I try to make it very simple, five Ps. What are the five Ps? Purpose, positioning, personality, promise, and platform. Okay, so let me explain a little bit about each one of them. And usually what I do is I then condense everything that's in that down to one single page. Uh, I learned this trick from working with uh, with um, Unilever. Uh, actually, I was working with Hindustan Lever in India when I did this one. Is that they have a thing called the brand key, and it actually is more, a little bit more complicated and a little bit harder to understand. But anyway, it's basically the same kind of elements. But the five Ps. We start off with purpose. What are you for? What purpose do you serve? What business are you in, and who are you for? Um, give you an example of this. So Apple. Okay, everyone knows Apple, right? Don't have to explain what they do. Um, did you know that in um, the movies, when it comes to product placement, no bad guy ever carries an Apple phone? Didn't know that. Right? Didn't know. Right. So what does that tell you, right? They are for the good guys, right? They're the good brand, right? Only the heroes carry their brand, right? Okay. So deciding on who you are for, right, the type of audience you're trying to attract and the kind of business that you're in is really the foundation of everything. Ask that question, why should I exist? And that becomes a really the base point. It's the building block of everything else. The most rational probably of all the emotional kind of elements that you have to consider. So positioning, number two, you are not alone. There was many people who always say the same things. And I've done this for companies where I've gone into, looked at a competitor set. I make a list of all of the brand promises that they make. And they all kind of sound very similar. So that's a good thing because that means what I can do is come up with something very different and stand out from the rest. You've got to ask yourself, what are your USPs, right? You know, mm -hmm. so unique selling points, unique sort of proposition, whatever you'd like to call those words. It means, do I have something that's unique to me that nobody else does? Um, it, in this heart, in this word, it's very, very tough. It's very tough to differentiate that way. So think about them also from a tangible benefit and also an emotional benefit perspective. Do you also have something that you know about the marketplace that nobody else does at insight? That also can help you with positioning. And I say this, you say, you can't be everything to everybody. Mm -hmm because otherwise it will be nothing to nobody. So you yeah. have to be very, very persistent about that. So the next P is personality. So uh, the best example I can give personality is like, is say I use myself. Okay, so what are my attributes? What does it make, what do I have in me that makes me useful to my clients? I have to be gutsy, grounded and curious. Gutsy enough to stand up and say what I mean, what I think, what I believe. Grounded that I've done the homework. I understand the market terrain. I've, I've looked where nobody else will look, right? And curious because I really want to turn over every stone. I want to find out more. I want to probe you harder. I want to make you work harder to learn about yourself and about your brand. So the personality attributes are really important. They, they can set the tone of voice for a brand it can be the way that you talk you know and say for instance the example i give you is usually innovation so we said that innovation and and uh, marketing. marketing are the two things but if everybody's about innovation don't tell me that you're an innovative brand because every brand is innovative right so don't pick things that everybody will want because you can't have them just Whatever on the note of uh, innovation, um, Colin, sorry to interrupt, mm. but it, there's yeah. a tag on question from Paul Emerson. Thanks for joining us today, Paul. So regarding Welcome, Paul. Uh, uh, brand innovation, one, mm. what comes first, the product or the consumer? And he says, if there's time to, is there a recommended approach to innovation from Colin? Okay, so in a, what is innovation? <laughs> If you look at the, te the textbook definition of innovation, actually, it's tinkering, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I work with um, uh, he, this guy is he's one of the kind of like founding guys in Singapore you know, in the sort of early 90s. And, uh, you know, I said to him, you know, he, he was actually the chairman of um, a thing called A-Star. 
which is like a, a collection of all the top agencies that are, are research and development and innovation, everything, right? So I said to him, so, you know, all this, is, this must be about innovation. He says, no, 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 we're not innovators. We're discoverers. We discover things. Innovation is just tinkering. We discover things. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And, uh, you know, from that, you know, you think innovation, you know, is, is about taking something that exists and moving it forward. It's taking the next step. Right? It's not necessarily changing everything or being disruptive. Yes, you know, it's great if you can be that, but not everybody can be disruptive. We're not everybody's going to be a grab. Not everybody's going to be a, 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 um, an Airbnb. Right? And uh, for those people that have that privilege, fantastic. But for but us mere mortals, <laughs> we have to kind of be satisfied with taking, you know, version, you know, 2.0 and making 3.0. Um, but it is a very important thing. But if you don't have an innovation, if you don't have a way forward, uh, you really are, are not going to be able to compete in the future. If you're going to be a me too product, you know, and sometimes, you know, an innovation can be simply something of looking at what is the trend that everybody is going towards and then saying, can I, is there something that able to fit my product or my service to meet that? So like an example of this capital land, uh, they're one of the biggest property owners in Singapore. They have about 10 office towers here. So they asked us to think about what would office 2.0 be like? How would we communicate this to, and how would we make an offering around this? You know, and it comes down to something like, okay, so the millennials, I actually think about you know what is that building doing with all of its electricity uh is it, is it is it kind of good for the environment do you have you know if we if i if somewhere i cycle my bike to work is there end of journey facilities for me able to take a shower and change my clothes and and those kind of questions then say actually well the way people look at the office environment is very different to the way that probably you know my my age group did you know it was a place i turned up i had a desk i worked now they see it as something that actually has to be positive you know environmentally positive it has to be sensitive to these things so developers have to change their whole strategy to move away from i'm just building a concrete glass and steel building to i'm building a community um the companies that come and work there want to recruit good people but these good people won't join them unless they have a feeling that their company is in the right place so then the strategy of the companies that they then take on as tenants then becomes part of their strategy in order to be, you know, a place that is uh, work positive. So you can see, you know, it, it's kind of everything's connected to everything else and you can't avoid, um, you know, the, 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 that kind of like the thing, innovation, you know, marketing, they kind of in a cycle, they're linked together, they're, they're, they're indivisible as such. Um, okay, so I was just talking to you about you know, purpose, positioning, personality, promise. So this is where it kind of comes together. Now I mentioned to you something called com compelling truth, um, and you know, uh, to me that's really like the crux of it. Is is what is your mantra? What is the narrative? What is the story behind your brand? And, you know, and I had a couple of young uh, guys uh, uh, that came to me the other day who had invented a superfood product, and and. They said, look, you know, we come up with a packaging, we come up with a name, we got all the, you know, everything. He said, but we don't have a story. I said, so why did you do this? What, what made you go and do this? He said, well, this guy's about six foot tall. He's an Indian guy, six, about six foot tall. And he said to me, um, you know, I used to be like 250 pounds. And I said, what, you're kidding me? You're like, you know, really? He goes, yeah, well, because I changed my diet, because I, I, I started to look at superfood as a way of me being able to, to change my physique and change my health and change my outcomes. And he said, um, and it was easy. It's easy. So I said, I want to tell other people it's easy. And so I said, well, there's your story. That is the story of your brand. That's the authenticity. You are the story of that brand. And so telling that story, then he becomes a real brand, not just a marketing ploy not just another product on the shelf. Here is somebody that's done something and he's done it himself and he wants to share that with you. And it makes a great video. It makes a great story. It makes a compelling truth, right? So once we have these things, we have a purpose, we're clear about why we exist. We kind of know who is out there and what they're doing and we have something different to say. We are, we are committed to a kind of behavior, a kind of, um, you know, a kind of experience that we want to create and we have a promise that is really authentic. Then you're ready to say, okay, let's go to market. Let's create a brand on that basis. And, you know, whether it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, 
you know, what channel choices you have, what kind of, you know, whether your customers are experiencing online and offline, you know, it has to be one that fits all together. And it's that kind of thing where you start to look across all your touch points to try to find that whatever people meet you, whenever they see you, they get that same feeling inside of them, that it's universal. Um, and, you know, like, say, for instance, it can be visual, it can be verbal, even down to things like, say, for instance, the complaints, how you deal with a complaint can be a, a defining moment. American Express, uh, I mean, I'm just about to cut up my Amer Amer American Express card again, but, you know, they're fantastic at service recovery. You know, that's one of their strongest points, but people don't realize this, right? Um, so, you know, if you look at the different channels there are, I mean, you know, 61% um, people are looking online. 17% is broadcast material, 9% is through gaming. I mean, that's a huge opportunity space for certain types of products that their audience is gaming. You know, I, I was watching a, a movie the other day where uh, these terrorists were talking to each other, but they were using it through the gaming console, you know, right. and that's the way they were able to get things. You know, so, you know, it's a, it's a real way of being able to talk to customers. Uh, broadcast radio is only 8% and print medium, you know, where I grew up on is only 6%, you know, so online has become a huge media consumption. But then you look at online, online is not one place, it's a million different places. How do you decide on how to, to put your ad or your, or your messages in that right place? If you've got the right message, then it's how are you going to reach the right audience? And that, again, is a huge kind of stumbling block for a lot of people. But, you know, again, I say, if you think about who are you for and you consider what kind of things they look at, what they, what interests they have, this kind of informs you about the media choices. So, you know, it is a little bit of a mechanical process to begin with. You know, we've got things like we're going to, you're going to have to review everything that you have in your brand. You're going to have to do an audit of that. You're going to have to look at your competitors, go to their websites, write down all the things that they say, because that tells you what not to say. You're going to have to think about what drives that business. You know, what is your vision for the future? Uh, and align that to the kind of behaviors that you want to have, not just for yourself as the business owner, but also for all of your staff and your team. And um, you know, a huge part of work that I do is internal engagement because that thing says, you know, the you know the boss says, oh, well, we're going to be we're going to be uh, 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 empathic, uh, but then you get down to the shop floor and people are oh, definitely not that. <laughs> I don't yeah. shit, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, Colin, sorry to interrupt you, but there's sure. a, sort of a tag-on question from one of our sure. participants, SK Sharma. Thanks for joining us today. So Thank what you. essentially he's asking is SMEs, especially during these times, really can't afford to do a proper brand study or a rebranding exercise. And is there a simpler, more cheaper way, uh, you know, yeah. for, for this process? And mm. can they rebrand with that same effect that you're talking about? Okay. All right, so everything I just described doesn't cost a lot of money, okay? If you are to evaluate yourself, it doesn't cost you anything except your own time. And during COVID, this is the time to navel gaze. Look at yourself. Walk through your customer's shoes means you really look at your own processes and systems. You look at everything. And is it aligned to the vision that you originally had for that business? Again, that doesn't cost anything. Looking at, say, for instance, the drivers of the business, understanding the USPs, that doesn't cost you anything. As an SME, you can do all of these processes on your own with a very little cost. Looking at your competitors, looking at their websites, understanding what you're saying versus what they're saying. No cost. It's you can do it yourselves. So this is a DIY kind of version of what I call brand DNA. But in, at the end of the day, this is the things that uh, if you can't afford to do a brand uh, evaluation using someone outside, a lot of these things actually are intuitive and you can do them yourself, right? So um, to answer that question, it doesn't really cost a lot of money to do these things. It's just the time and effort. And if you're having downtime, this is the best time to do it. You know, um, so, spot you know, on, 
Spot on, Colin. I think I think a lot of people, I think what I'm hearing, I've been listening very intently and not asking many questions today, mm. which is very unusual for me. <laughs> <laughs> As people who, who've been regular viewers will tell you. But, you know, I, I was just mulling through. And it's, it's really fundamentally, um, you know, if you look at it and, and it starts from the your premise of how you define brand as as a uh, is an amalgamation of behaviors and reputation so mm. i think and also this this point you just made which is the navel gazing right i mean this is a, a, a ideal time to really understand maybe you know you you were something in the past you sort of evolved your business has grown or maybe you're starting mm. something new and when mm. when you start something new sometimes you know you just start right i mean you, you say yeah let's let's you know capitalize yeah. on an opportunity that you see you you get going mm. You, you make a few sales, uh, you know, you get a few things going and then suddenly things sort of taper off, which, which, mm. which the typical part of the life cycle of, of, of new companies. Um, yeah. and, and, and that's, and that's fine. I think that is, that will be a great time to sort of reevaluate and say, Hey, what are we really about? Okay. That opportunity mm. that we kind of started. Yeah. That gave us five, 10 customers, you know, maybe get us to a certain point of revenue, uh, you know, those things are now tapering off. It, does, it doesn't seem like they're resonating with people that we want to chase. And maybe what, what I think what you're, what you're advocating in, uh, and, uh, and are saying that people do, and maybe on a more frequent basis than they think, is to sort of co continuously like reevaluate, you know, what are we, who are we trying to address? What is that market that we're trying to do? And what do we want to be? Because in the time that you started and the time that uh, you've, you've sort of progressed, Competitors mm. have also moved into that space. Others have, you know, come in and said, "Me too, maybe," or, or "I'm different from, from Colleen Anderson or Lavendra, right?" So, so mm. you have to sort of figure out you know, what are the competitors have, you know, because they they be a, maybe a lot more competitors uh, there than you think. And I think one of the things that it, this uh, whole pandemic has done and this whole virtual world is that we think our competitors are the the, the shop next door, when in fact it's 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 a country away or a continent away right because today right, you, can, right. you can buy anything anywhere right uh, and, and people forget that and people think oh you know my competitor is the the person i've been competing for the last 10 years and in fact you know that person is no longer your competitor your customers are buying from somebody from from another country yeah and i, yeah. I you know i think that's that realization that sort of self assessment is is needed and i think yeah. uh, you've given some great points to to us to sort of ponder and i, I mean, and i think I mean, look at really crucial Look at, look at, say, for instance, what, what happens during COVID. I mean, in Singapore, there was a boom in terms of being able to buy food online. So who is the competitor? In fact, if you look at it, actually, it's not restaurants competing against each other. Actually, what it is is grab food, um, and, uh, and we have Food Panda here. You have different ones there, right? Mm -hmm. They were taking 35% of the market. You know, they were taking away the value out of the restaurants. That's their profit margin. How the hell to survive? So, in fact, what a lot of the restaurants started to do is to create their own way of getting the product to the customer. Yeah. Um, you know, and as you know, I kind of because I've been become a vegan. You know, it's it's like I only go to certain restaurants, and I actually we have a good rapport with people in these restaurants, and they volunteer to give us all the food without any cost of the transportation. So, you know, you think it's, it's not just necessarily just that you're competing a restaurant against another restaurant or a food kind against another food kind. What you're actually competing sometimes it's the mechanism of the business and covid has also created its own kind of um kind of way in which the whole ecosystem is become off balance so you know it is a very complex story i'm not saying it's simple or easy and and i to say that i would be you know uh, undervaluing what it is that a lot of entrepreneurs have to go through um but you know if you look also at things that even though we are in a difficult time, it's really important to bear in mind the fundamentals of business. And if you look at, and you know, when I first kind of came into this business, you know, many, many decades ago, there was a book which was called, um, I'm trying to think what it's called now, it's called, uh, oh, God, I keep okay, uh, how do I describe this then? I describe it, it, it basically was taking a sample of the top 100 Fortune 500 companies and it compared it to the next 100 Fortune 500 companies. So from, you know, company, you know, from one to 100 went against company 199, you know, to up to, to, up to, to 100. And they found that there were traits about the top 100 companies versus the ones at the bottom, right? And it's these kind of traits, like, say, for instance, things like having an idea 
of what motivates the business and having a leadership that believes in it. Um, uh, you know, Richard Lester, I think he's the guy who wrote Productivity Edge, he said something like this, and sorry if I paraphrase, uh, you know, it's the success is that the companies that have a deep conviction in something are more likely to, to survive than those companies that don't have a, that same deep conviction. And, you know, and it must be something must be felt at every level of the organization. So, you know, the belief, no matter what it is, is also a driving force for success, COVID or no COVID. You know, it, it's, it's a very, very important distinction between success and failure in the long term. Um, you know, and I, 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 I think about uh, in industries, I think about companies, I think about products and services, you know, so many people kind of have this sort of kind of viewpoint that it's about, uh, you know, about sales. Uh, I'm sales driven, you know, I, 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 I value uh, the, you know, it's the sales mentality, right? If you take that away, if you think about, you know, what other things and what I'm doing other than making money, why do I want to commit my life to building my brand? Why would I want to spend all this time, you know, in this company, you know, and I work from six in the morning till six at night every day. So, you know, I want to spend that time doing something that's meaningful to me. And if you can do that and make that meaningful, not just to yourself, but also the people you work with you create a very different dynamic and a different distinction, a different definition of success. And it's not just in value to value terms in terms of dollars and cents. Right. So uh, sometimes, you know, this is kind of this use this time to kind of, you know, go back to basics. Think about what it is that you did when you started this business. Think about why is it you want to continue in this business? And probably they're the same reasons why customers want to come to you. Colin, really? just before we wrap up, just we mm. covered purpose, positioning, personality, promise. I think the audience is mm. interested to know about the last P. Platform, is it? Which one? The last P, purpose, positioning, personality, okay. promise. And platform. Platform. Okay. okay, so platform is really what you go to. That's what people see. If you think about the, the um, if you think about the iceberg, right? <laughs> Not that if you want to be on the Titanic and hit the iceberg, right? But it's always that little tip bit at the top, right? That's what people see. They see logos, they see identity, they see communications, they see strap lines, they see ads, you know, they see the website. But without the stuff below that, that doesn't mean anything. You can't even hold up yourself up. You know, it's all the things below that surface, your values, your compelling truth, uh, your reason to be, your whys. And that's kind of like... Um, uh, where it's at. Okay, so that's so, the definition we, of platform. Uh, platform is that the, it actually platform is actually the the last thing that you do is the the most you know the the thing that everybody sees, uh, which is your identity, your communications, your advertising. It's your outer face, but without the inner face, it doesn't have any standing. Right. Point taken. Yes. Yes. So we are, we are right about the at the hour, Colin, and uh, Fantastic. it's 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 been an absolutely fascinating one. I think we've answered most of the questions that were posed to us. Um, so uh, thank you for for sending those across to us. And I think for those of who who of you who are probably joining us from uh, Slascom Sri Lanka, you will get a chance to actually get more of uh, Colin's wisdom in a private. Uh, members only conversation we're having with him and other experts on the 2nd of September. Please join, join us for that. But uh, for the rest of you, we will have a recording of this obviously on our channels. Uh, thanks again to our uh, main sponsor Hatch uh, for making this happen. Uh, and Colleen, thanks again for you. I mean, I, this has been a fascinating conversation. I have I've, I've listened a lot more than I have uh, asked questions today, frankly, because, and then Kartika finds that very amusing, frankly, because I've been learning a lot. So, so I usually keep my mouth shut when, that, when I'm learning. Uh, so, uh, so, so thanks again, Colin. I think, uh, you know, in terms of sort of, uh, you know, the definition that sticks in my mind is the initial one is about behaviors and reputation. And I think people forget that how we behave, whether we behave as an individual or as a corporate entity, right? That and that and the reputation that both behaviors create is essentially the cornerstones of our brand. And I think I think we sometimes forget that, right? And and mm. uh, and, and figuring out how we want to behave or how we want to project 
and what is our core values, which is navel gazing that you so uh, eloquently uh, said that we should indulge in in these pandemic times, uh, I think is a very good starting point. And, and your key point there was that none of this uh, needs to cost a lot of money. In fact, it costs a lot of time and introspection and reflection and asking, I guess, uh, good uh, and tough questions. Uh, mm. if, even if you're not asking them yourselves, get someone who's close to you to probably ask those questions. And I mm. think uh, another component here that you know uh, you you didn't mention probably and probably meant was you could always talk to customers for free as well, right? So you well, can always no, call yeah. your customers up and have a chat with them and say, hey, yeah. you know what what made you initially buy from us and and are we doing a good enough job? You know, and and mm. and expect you know not so positive answers. And I think that that should be. And I think sometimes we are scared to ask our customers because we ourselves, you know, in the back of the mind, think I don't think we've really lived up to our own promise of, right. of delivering value. And, oh, you, you, I, you hit the nail on the head there, and it is really hard sometimes to face those questions. And yeah. you know, and to ask uh, again to ask customers what they really think again, it's not something you do straightforward. Like that question you said when we do the focus groups, you can't ask them what did you think about the bed, what did you think about the food and beverage. Right. Ask them the question like, what is the most fantastic holiday you've ever had, and then you're going to get an answer that you can work with. Right. Correct. So, Correct. Very good point. Yes, ex ex exactly. Yeah, the good good quality questions that not not necessarily have an <laughs> obvious straight answer. So, correct, correct. All right. Thank you so much, Colin. It's it's been a, a singular pleasure uh, having you as usual and chatting with Thank you. It. Look forward to our private one-on-one uh, -on -one with the members of of, of Slashcom on the second. Uh, okay. But again, uh, give, please give our regards and thanks to Ramona as well for everything on the high end. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and we'll catch you soon. Uh, we have another one this evening for, for with Mark Metry, so it's a double header Tuesday today. Uh, look forward to seeing all of you then as well. Take care. Thanks, Colin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a great day.